took place in Boston <laughs> and nobody cared right well some of you are probably wondering what I'm doing to assuage the pain that comes with missing rootstock I'm about to play gamble where I'm going to be a electrokinetic giant who is Kermit the Frog to see you. Yay! Imagine that, but, you know, bigger. I like it. And Ken. Enjoy the show. He's with us in spirit anyway. Our next person to come out on stage, you know him very well from Mythbusters. He knows a hell of a lot about robots. And he really doesn't like spiders or little fish touching him. We're very pleased to present, please welcome Grant Imahara. What do you think? I think I was wrong. Shields! Shields! JJ. Okay, here we go. Stop. Good. So, uh, what you are about to hear tonight was kept secret for a very long time. Now, normally when I speak in front of crowds, I expect them to speak about Mythbusters, which would be a logical assumption. And because it's Halloween, I'm wearing a Starfleet outfit. I'm going to commit sci-fi blasphemy and talk about Star Wars. These Starfleet outfits are easier to assemble on short notice, just so you know. Absolutely. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about Star Wars. And before I begin, a little bit of history, because right, everybody here is familiar with Star Wars, I know, but in 1977, the Star Wars movies came out, there were two droids. Now, it's well known that I was one of three official operators of the R2-D2 unit. Now, in Star Wars, there was the other unit, which is the gold one, the guy who's the fussy British robot, who was played by a fussy British guy. <laughs> His name is Anthony Daniels, and he is a brilliant actor. He is the voice, the, the body, the whole character of C-3PO. And contractually speaking, he is the only one who is to be in the costume, who is to portray this character on screen for the movies. And that is true. However, what is also true is that he is not the only one who has been in the C-3PO costume. There have been others in this costume. And by others, I mean me. <laughs> for 10 years, as one of my side duties working for Lucasfilm, uh, I joined a group, a secret group within Lucasfilm, a shadow organization. <laughs> a part of publicity that was so secret nobody knew about it. But if you had a cause that was great enough, that you needed to bring the droids to the people, and if you had enough money, and if you could find them, you could hire Lucasfilm character parents. 
This is a ragtag group of performers, some of whom work for Lucasfilm, others were brought in, who went around the country to uh, be these characters. Uh, Darth Vader, Chewbacca, C-3PO, R2-D2, and in some cases, an Ewok. <laughs> now, how did it all begin, you ask? How did you, Grant, be chosen? How were you chosen to become C-3PO? I mean, you know, who picked C-3PO out of the crowd? Well, it all began at Skywalker Ranch in 1994. I was working as a licensing engineer in THX, blowing up loudspeakers and amplifiers, a precursor to my current gig. <laughs> And my friends, uh, Don Bees and Nelson Hall, were the archivists. They were in charge of keeping track of all the costumes and props and models. And there was an event at Skywalker Ranch, a, an internal event, a, a licensing event to generate uh, excitement about the Star Wars movies. It was called the Star Wars Summit. Now, um, one day, before I get to the event, before I get to the anatomy of the suit. Uh, one day we were having lunch, and Don and Nelson had this kind of strange look on their faces. They knew the, the summit was coming up. They knew they needed someone to fill the suit, because nobody was going to fly Tony all the way over from England. He lives in London. That's a long flight. It's very expensive. We just need it for this one afternoon. We need someone who's about the right size. So we're having lunch. They look over at me, and they get this kind of strange look in their eyes. <laughs> and then they look at each other, I said, hey Grant, what are you doing after lunch? <laughs> so why? Well, I, I don't know nothing. Why don't you come by the archive building? We got something for you. <laughs> so I go to the archive building, <laughs> I put on this, this whole suit, and they, they, I'll tell you about it in a second, and then how we knew we had something was there's a switch right on the back that runs a battery pack that runs the lights. They hit the switch, and I'm standing in the suit, and I saw them both take a step back. Whoa, dude, this is totally gonna work. <laughs> now, what does it take to be in the suit? Well, the suit is actually composed of 18 major pieces. And I know what you're thinking, you're thinking, this is Photoshop trickery. I assure you, there's no trickery going on here. These pieces include the chest pieces, the legs, arms, and you can see right here, these arms are one piece that slide on as a sleeve. <laughs> I'll talk about this in a minute. <laughs> You've got hands and the head, and it's fairly complex. It takes about 20 minutes to half an hour to put on. Now this piece is interesting, and what it is is a pair of shorts that are made out of solid vinyl. That's, that's quarter inch thick. It's about as thick as your pinky. You have to heat them in order to put them on. <laughs> and not only that, you can't just slide them on, it involves a little dance. A little, a little something like this. There's a little amount of baby powder involved in the process, as is normal. <laughs> And that's, that's the first step in your journey to become C-3PO. Then you slide on the legs one by one, followed by the backs of the legs, which are held in place by these sort of paperclip type things. So if you have to get out, there's no quick getting out. You can't just, you know, it's not like putting on a rubber mask and a cloak and, hey, I'm an alien. No, no, you're committed to this thing for a while. So you've got the legs on, and you're pretty much dressed from halfway up. Oh, I forgot to mention, this right here is a girdle. Because <laughs> you need to keep looking trim when you're a robot. <laughs> and then you put on the hood, which makes you look like Cornholio. <laughs> oh. That is a very important part, though, because that keeps your hair and your ears from getting caught in the mask when they put the whole thing in case around your head. And then they put on the chest, and this is where it starts to get serious, because you start to feel how constricting it is. Now, the suit's not very heavy, but, you know, 20, 25 pounds over the course of a full day adds up. Then they slide on the arms, again, those long sleeves that slide all the way up that are separate from the chest, 
and they push on the hands, which are also made of vinyl. And then pretty much, you're ready to rock. Now, how does Siegfried get moved? Tony, in those days, did this brilliant job of, of describing what an android would walk like. Because obviously nowadays, you know, we all know what an android walks like, but back then, it's the 70s, nobody knew. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant performance. I mean, all that stuff he came up with with the walk and that, that it's... No. <laughs> I'm about to tell you now. This right here, my friends, is the key to the performance. <laughs> so, how I mentioned, they're very thick vinyl shorts that go all the way down. They inhibit your movement in such a way that when you try to walk, you can't lift your legs like normal. You do a kind of a shuffle, like this. That is how the walk came to be. The chest is separate, the arms are separate from the chest, like sleeves. So if you want to be surprised, <laughs> happy, <laughs> now you're beginning to get the picture. Which is why this, oh, Grant could definitely do that. The only thing that's really interesting thing uh, about it is that it's really played from the chest. So when you have your posture standing up straight, um, there's no mouth. So in order to talk, you play it from the chest and then you move your head really fast. And that's talking. <laughs> it's not what you think. Actually, it could be what you think. Be. So when you are an aging actor in the twilight of your career, and you need to make some extra cash, what do you do? You, well, you go to Japan. And you sell all kinds of things, like, you know, toothpaste and, and ham and noodles and, and all that sort of thing, because they have an agreement that prevents those commercials from being sold or shown in the United States, so that your image as an action hero, for example, remains intact without tainting it by you selling noodles. <laughs> Well, R2-D2 and C-3PO are, are no different than any of these stars. And when they go to Japan, what do they sell? They sell cars <laughs> for Mitsubishi. So this was my first gig uh, on the real appearance circuit. And they flew me all the way to Japan to be in this Mitsubishi commercial to sell cars, to sell minivans. <laughs> because 3 po and R2, why do they need a minivan? <laughs> Are they starting a family? <laughs> no? But here we are! <laughs> and, and 3PO and R2 in Japan, you know, they, they don't sound like Tony. Uh, R2 sounds like R2, obviously, but, but Tony doesn't sound like Tony. It's, it's somebody dubbed, and, and when C3PO sees something funny, he goes, Sugoi! <laughs> Which means, it's good! Um, and so we went to uh, Japan, we filmed uh, Freaky on R2 walking from Mitsubishi dealership. 